Man, what a strange, rare, and wonderful thing. I'm looking at my clock, and it says 7 o'clock on the nose. And I'm not looking at a little, a little wheel turning around and around and around with no results. I haven't lost my connection. It looks like I'm actually right here live at 7 p.m. on a Wednesday for the most latest, most greatest installment of Tent Talks Tunes. Coming at you. What's up, people? How y'all doing out there? Before I get overly enthusiastic, let me reach over here and give you guys the traditional close-up view of my very tall forehead as I reach over to the mainframe computer, aka the sit-down, so I can make sure that uh, I am indeed going out live and you people are indeed seeing me and hearing me. And hey, it looks like we are. This is great. I love it. The technology is great when it works. Mike Lesser wants to know if my sound is on. I don't know. It should be. Can people hear me? Apparently you can see me, but can you hear me? Let's get a report from everybody out there. Can you all hear me? I'll make some weird noises and stuff while we're waiting to get um, some feedback on that. Can anybody hear me? I need to see some thumbs ups or... Uh, Mr. Stephen Costello says 10-4 on the audio. Okay, that's good. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you right now a little... Um, Sean Mosher, he can hear me. Mike Lesser, have you cleaned out your ears lately? Mike, clean your ears. Get a Q-tip. Mike, just saying. Hello. All right, I'm not my brother's keeper. It's up to all of you viewers of Tent Talks Tunes to make sure that your ears are clean and that you can indeed hear me because we're taking advantage of this very rare occasion when the technology has been working spotlessly from the get-go. So I'm a happy guy, you're a happy guy. One little soundbite I was going to send at you while we were waiting for some results. Um, and this is, this is all Jeff Clayton's fault. As you people may know, Jeff Clayton, my boss in anti-scene, has his web stream, podcast, thing, whatever, every... Tuesday night at 8 p.m. It's called Break On Through, and it runs on the Anti-Scene official Facebook page. And it's we're, we do fairly similar things. Uh, we talk about music. We give our opinions. We commiserate with everybody out there. It's a lot of fun. And last night, he was going through a viewer suggestion who wanted to know about his favorite riffs. And, you know, of course, the discussion was, well, what, what is a riff anyway? Is it a guitar? Is it a drum? What is it that's, that constitutes a riff? In my opinion, a riff is anything played by any instrument that is so instantly catchable and catchy that you just can't resist it. And um, I'm not even going to try to go through my favorite riffs, but the first one that came to my mind last night when he was talking about irresistible riffs is actually a drum riff. It's from The Police. It's the opening drum riff to Can't Stand... Is it Can't Stand Losing You? See, I can, I can remember the actual drum riff better than the song, but the one that goes... It's like... And then the song begins. Yeah, it's Can't Stand Losing You. It's like... One, two, three, four, five. Five hits on the snare, including one on the, on the ride cymbal. Instantly, obsessively catchy. One of the best riffs in the entire history of mankind. So thank you, Stuart Copeland. And thank you, Jeff Clayton, because of the two of you, I've had <laughs> running over and over and over in my mind, almost nonstop for close to 24 hours now. I guess that means it's a great riff. Let's hoist our jugs of Danbury tap water or whatever it is that you imbibe to the concept of the great riff. Brandon Yitai is on board. Brandon's going to have a very busy weekend down there in the Queen City of Charlotte, North Carolina. I will not be there because, uh, well, I'm being brutally honest, my services are not required 
for the uh, gala recording of the live performance of the Eat More Possum album by the Almighty Anti Scene. Um, the boys are doing it. They're going to convene in our super secret special location for recording, and um, it's going to be as close to the original lineup of Eat More Possum as is humanly possible these days. Jeff Clayton, Greg Clayton, Walt Wheat, and Tom O'Keefe. I guess Tom's going to be in town for that. Hmm. And they're going to play the entirety of the Eat More Possum album live in a studio in preparation to do a webcast for the special deluxe reissue of Eat More Possum. So, hello, Brandon. Hope the guys don't work you too hard. Then, you know, then again, maybe I hope they do, because you know what? You need the discipline. You need the discipline. You need the discipline. And anti scene is the band to give it to you. But you already knew that. You already knew that. You're a mellow guy, but you're a smart guy. Ah, Brandon Yitai, after I just gave him that severe shellacking, says that I will be missed. Well, now I feel almost bad. Kind of bad. Semi-bad. Bad-ish. Bad-ish. That's what happens when you speak the truth. What can I tell you? You speak the truth, sometimes you end up feeling bad for 35 or 40 seconds. You know, that's the way it goes. Oh, my stars and garters. Busy, busy week here. Compounded by the fact that I am leaving in less than two weeks to go on tour again. Profanatica. The originators of U.S. black metal are hitting the road again. We're going to be on the road for not one, not two, but three weeks. Three solid weeks in the eastern half of the U.S. and Canada. We are starting in Providence, Rhode Island. Going up to Montreal. Down to Florida and then back up to Brooklyn. And um, playing just about every single night. And I'm very excited about that. It's a fun gig. So if you look at uh, Profanautica's official Facebook page or their website, you will see the various dates posted. And if y'all can come out to any of the shows, please do. I love hanging out with everybody in person and uh, and maybe grab a bite to eat or something. Uh, walk around the block. It's just fun. It's really, really cool. I love being on the road and... Um, Taking it to the people. It's a blast and a half. As if that weren't enough, and believe me, it's not enough. Whoa, look at this main marquee event going on right here. April 4th in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Anti-scene, Eat the Turnbuckle, Fang, and a host of others. At what is sure to be a wild night of pure wrestling rock and roll mayhem for an Eat the Turnbuckle reunion slash farewell to show, farewell show. We have been uh, honored beyond belief to have been asked to partake in this event. And, um, you know, one thing that we agree on, all four of us in Anti-Scene, is that if you're going to have an opening act, they better be a good opening act. And if you're going to be the opening act, you better get ready and be prepared to give the openers a run for their money. That's what makes a good show. So we intend to bring the show. I don't think we can guarantee the degree of pure, utter mayhem that Eat the Turnbuckle are going to indulge in, but we're going to rock. We're going to rock. We're going to roll. You're going to hear wrestling songs. You're going to hear chestnuts. You're going to see some spectacle in the true, patented, anti-scene manner. So if you're anywhere within driving, flying, walking, teleporting distance of Philadelphia on April 4th, come to this show. Once in a lifetime, I guarantee it. We are also playing that same weekend two other dates. Um, it's penciled in right now for York, Pennsylvania and uh, Youngstown, Ohio. We don't have the absolute confirmation on those yet, but that's kind of what it's looking like. Keep your eye on social media for more developments on those uh, along those lines. So yeah, yeah, old man tense rocking out a lot in the next coming weeks and months. This is good. This is very good. Um, I don't think I've got anything else on the bulletin board. 
So why don't we just get right back down to the nitty gritty and uh, do Tent Talks tunes, what do you think? Now some of you might be saying, well, gee whiz, aren't you going to check the mailbox? Believe me, we're going to check the mailbox. We're going to check the mailbox. That's actually part, a large part of today's show. Because the mail has been coming in fast and furious. You know, every once in a while I'll go on Tent Talks tunes and I'll make a a teary-eyed complaint about how empty my mailbox is and how a full mailbox is a happy mailbox. You know, getting all lacrimose and shiz. And you know what? You, the people, do respond. And I do occasionally get things in the mail as a result. So I'm going to show you right now. There's the address, Malcolm Tent, P.O. Box 3626, Newtown, Connecticut, 06470. My mailbox loves it when things arrive, and I enjoy when it's appropriate and when it's asked for to send things back in the tradition of mail trading. In fact, if I look over to my right at about the one o'clock position, I've got a big stack of mail that's about to go out, including some of the people who have sent me really cool things over the past couple of weeks. So, people, if I said I was going to send you something, it's happening real soon. I'll drink to that. Of course, part of it, whew, hey, Greg Lathrop, 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 Greg, whatever your last name pronunciation is. Hey, dude, thanks for tuning in. Um, part of the reason why the mail piles up sometimes is because I do, believe it or not, being the, uh, the happy workaholic that I am, I do occasionally take time out and do things that are not work-related. Like last night, for example, I am not a moviegoer, per se. The running joke is, if you want me to see a movie, you got to grab me by the ear, sit me down in front of the screen, and play it for me. And I'll, I will definitely watch the movie. Normally, I don't go out of my way to watch movies. Um, but for some reason, last night was a, an, ex, a, an exception to that rule. And the reason being that I've been doing a massive house cleaning project over this winter, just trying to clear stuff out. Uh, we got a message here. I'm going to minimize it from Bill Miski, or is it Miski Bill? Hey, Bill, thanks for writing, but I will talk to you later once Tent Talk Students is done. Um, yeah, massive house cleaning, you know? And this is something else that Jeff Clayton's been talking about, too. It's like at some point you realize you just got too much stuff, and the stuff's got to go. It's got to go to places and people who will enjoy them. And um, that's what I've been doing. And so uh, last night I was going through a cabinet full of DVDs I had, and I came across a movie, a movie that was sealed and unopened. And I said, why do I have this movie? Why is this movie here? Why do I have a copy of this movie, Virgil Bliss, sealed and unopened? What's the point of this? Well, why don't I find out? Why don't I watch it? That'll help me decide whether I'm going to keep it or dispose of it. And I gotta admit, this is a real good movie. This movie was so good, I actually sat down and watched the whole thing basically from start to finish while I was having my supper last night and brushing my teeth and doing all that. And um, I really enjoyed this. Has anybody out there seen this movie? It's really good. I, um, in my typical fashion, did some internet research on it after I was done watching it. And also in the typical fashion of all the stuff that I really love, this thing got mostly lukewarm to fair reviews. You know, it's like it got a 6.8 .8 out of 10, 70% um, aggregate rating, C+. Plus. I'm like, you people are nuts, man. This, this movie rocks, okay? And this is from a guy who doesn't even watch movies, but I know a good movie when I see one. So it's pretty dark. It's very dark, and it's not typically Hollywood in the slightest bit. The narrative is very cut and dry, but it's got great characters, good good writing. Not everything is handed to you on a plate. You have to actually figure things out. I like that. Maybe that's why it's gotten uh, such lukewarm reviews. Like You have to actually have to work a little bit to really get what's going on in this movie. This is a movie you can watch more than once and get something out of it every single time. So yeah, I watched a movie last night and I enjoyed it. 
Maybe if you guys like movies, especially ones that aren't Hollywood standard fare, check this out. I did see there's actually a part two that I think came out last year or is about to come out. I'm excited and check it out. Anyway, that's why the mail piles up. I was actually doing something other than packing and shipping mail last night. Go figure. So anyway, we got the mail and people send really cool things. And I like to share it with you people because we all have similar tastes. Do we not? And if we disagree on some things, well, I think we've agreed to disagree. And that's cool too. I'm not here to change anybody's mind. I'm not here to tell anybody that they're right or wrong. I'm here to put my opinion forth. And then you guys have the right and the liberty to run it up the flagpole and either salute or throw brickbats at it or whatever. That's the beauty of it, the discourse of ideas. So let's see what we got here in the mail. This is from my pal Adam Zisser in Atlanta, GA. I know Adam because Adam has done much duty now for the future in his service as a bongo player, drummer, percussionist extraordinaire in the Spud Boys, which is the Devo tribute band that plays quite often at the devotional Devo fan gathering in Cleveland, Ohio. And that is happening this year, as it always does. September, I don't have the exact date in front of me, but if you know what's Devo and you want to stay in touch with your inner devolved self and share the true spirit of de-evolution with a whole room full of foaming at the mouth, like mind believers, just, man, gravity always wins. Play it safe and earmark the entire month of September for the devotional, because it's fun. So anyway, Adam, when he's not beaten on the bongos, has been known to place things in envelopes and send them to me. Bruiser Braswell is in the house. What's up, Bruiser? How are things in Hickory? You're about to see me open this thing from Adam Zisser. Well, we got some awesome packing material. I do like the packing material. We got, um, what is this? It's, ah, uh, now this is cool. A Frank Zappa comic book. This could be, uh... Man, depending on how in-depth you want to get, this could be like an entire library, but they've distilled the story of Frank Zappa into one handy-dandy comic book. And speaking of devotional, check it out. Here's a flyer for devotional 2019. That was a lot of fun. Bob One was special guest. Yes, love it. Thank you very much. What else we got here from Adam Zisser? See, these are the things, man. The things the material objects that make things much more interesting than mere digital downloads, you know. Oh, dear me. Now the, um, my screen has just gone black and I don't know if I'm on the air anymore. Let me reach over here and uh, click the refresh button and see if we can do any better. It serves me right for being all enthusiastic about the technology allegedly working. All right, apparently it's on. Okay. Apparently a, a big burp or a hiccup on my end. Adam says I'm on. Grant says I'm on. So I'm on. Anyway, material objects. Downloads are fine. They've got their place. They've got their purpose. But we love tangibles, such as this vintage cassette by Adam Zister's old band Whirly Gig. And right away, I love the cover. The entrance to Fool Land. That definitely tweaks my sardonic sense of humor. So yeah, I love 90s music. 90s was a very good decade for music. And Mr. Adam Baum on the drums has assured me that this is good stuff. So I'm willing to find out. Adam, you're tuned in. If you could give us, like, say, a five or six word synopsis of Whirly Gig so the people know what we're talking about. How would you describe your band from 1990 blank? Let us know. We're all curious. We're all fans. Some of us are musicians. We want to know. We want to know. There's been some discussion of whether or not that would, would be uh, reissued on TPOS. 
I don't know. We gotta see. As The Clash once said on a uh, button, the future is unwritten. Oh, let's see, man. Adam sent me all kinds of good weird stuff here, huh? Here's a clip. A live concert promotional clipping of the EVO. Don't know what year it's from. Sometime after 2004, I'm going to imagine. It's Devo, baby. I love it. I love it. Oh, more Devo. Devo written about on Genuine Honest to Gosh newsprint. This is fun. Devo actually had a, a side project called the Wipeouters, in which they played all surf music. It was every member of Devo at the time except Jerry. And uh, yeah, that's a fine, fun, festive record. And here's a postcard for it. Ah, here's a Devo postcard for the after party when they played Central Park. And I was at that show, and I was actually at this after party. Uh, Mark and Jerry got up with the band who was on stage. The event was at an Indian restaurant, bar, or whatever. And Jerry and Mark got up with the in-house band and did an Indian Raga-style version of Girl You Want. Very, very cool. Ah, it was, if, I'm, if I might use some rude language, pissing down rain. And it was great because the rain held off until almost the exact second that the Devo concert was over. It was perfect. Perfect. Uh, here we go, Devo at the Irving Plaza. I don't think I was at this one. For some reason, I missed the shows in 2010. I don't know why. One of the few instances that I missed Devo. Look, the English Beat played, too. I've seen the English Beat a couple of times, and I was shocked by how many awesome songs they have. The English Beat are one of those bands who I never really thought about too much until I went to go see them, and one song after another, every one of them was a hit, you know, or at least something I remembered and knew. I, I, I just was not aware of the English Beat having that, having had that many great songs. It was really cool. Would I go see them again? I probably would. Oh, more Devo clippings. I don't know what this is. Like a poster catalog of some sort. Devo being one of the best and most advanced graphic groups ever. Let's see. Here's Devo in L.A. And here's a strange devolved postcard about the Devo bots. What is this? Hmm, something about an Oingo Boingo appearance. And of course, one of the uh, very rare... Oh no, this is not an ad for the Devo Something for Everybody album. This is an ad for a gig for Something for Everybody, which is a fantastic Devo album. Very much worthy of the legacy of the band. Devotional 2006 flyer, yes. Devo promo picture in two tones. What a bunch of spuds. Some event, I don't know, but you know what I said about being them, about Devo being graphically perfect? Look at that. Look at that simplicity and strength of design. Hardly gets better than that. Then we got a whole bunch of other stuff too, all Devo related. Thank you, Adam. My inner spud right now is cooking in a vat of hot fan grease. And here's a used pick of some sort. I'm assuming it's a used pick. No, it's two picks. Who are they from? Can't quite see. They're in a bag. Ah, yes, from the Devo Maddox. What do you know? Devo Maddox. Hey. Coincidence, Adam. Coincidence. Thank you very much. Good fun. Good fun. Uh, Gary Childs is providing us with more information about the contents of that envelope. Thank you, Gary. All right, that was just one. Here's another box. This is from my good pal, Tim Holehouse. You guys have heard me talk about Tim a lot. Tim is from London, England. I have played all over the U.S. with him. I have played uh, England with him a couple of times. We've done a couple of gigs in Northern Europe. Tim is a real good guy and a true troubadour non-stop touring maniac with an acoustic guitar and he sent me this box right here you can probably guess by the size and the shape it's 
it's got to be records. So let's take the very minimally engaged box cutter, carefully slit it open, and see what we got. Here it is. We are opening this thing live on the Facebook. All of us together are discovering what's in here. Oh boy, Harry's on the floor. He wants to come up and say hi, but the lap is engaged right now, little guy. All right, you know what? He's being insistent. Let's let's give let's have Harry come on for a cameo. Come here, guy. Here he is, the one and only Harry the Cat. Yay! It would hardly be an episode of Tent Talks Tunes if we didn't have Harry coming up here and making a ham of himself. My oh boy. By the way, speaking of Harry the Cat. And how could we not speak of Harry the Cat? Speaking of Harry the Cat, I've been threatening for a long time to do this. And guess what? I did it. Or I should say I'm starting to do it. I have teased on numerous occasions the idea of a Harry the Cat release on TPOS. The sounds of this, can you hear that? You guys hear that purr? How about this? Harry the Cat, eight track. You can play it on an endless loop and hear Harry the Cat purring on recorded tape. It's an eight track. See, Harry seems to like it. That's the front, that's the back. Sean Mosher was the guy who nudged me and inspired me to start production on this. So we got Harry the Cat on 8-track. It plays on an endless loop. You can hear him purr forever if you want. Coming soon on cassette and CD. And I swear to Jah, if I had the money, I'd press it on vinyl. Harry the Cat. Here we are. So Sean, get in touch with me. We're going to make this happen. Anybody else out there who wants to have Harry the Cat recorded? Talk to me. We're going to make it happen. I'm in the middle of editing some more audio tracks so I can do CD and cassette as well. Harry the Cat, guys. He sits on my lap, and now he's a recording star. Yay! Greg, Craw <laughs> Greg Crawford wants to know if we can get that autographed. I don't know. He's a very moody guy. He's very temperamental. I can ask him nicely. I'll ask very nicely if you'll deign to sign a couple of Harry the Cat CDs or cassettes or eight tracks. Well, I don't know. What do you think, guy? Would you would you send an autograph? Would you autograph something by these for these people? See, the problem is I don't think Harry speaks English. I, I really don't think he speaks. We don't have a common language here. It's a big problem. As Walt Wheat says, pawtographed. That might work. That might work. <laughs> I'm sure I've got some fingerprint ink around here somewhere. Could work for a paw print. A pawtograph. That's Walt Wheat, folks. My compatriot in the almighty anti-scene. If you want to meet the guy in person, Philly on April 4th. Good time and place to do it. All right, that was one little detour. Well, let's get let's do two little detours. Walt also plays on the Anti-Scene People's Choice album, and because of popular demand, I made a few on CD in the absolute DIY punk rock fashion. Everything done by hand. Hand stamped on the disc, hand stamped and stickered on the sleeve. Each one unique, no two alike. See, it's fun to slip in these plugs during the program because uh, everybody should live to the fulfillment of their art. And one of my arts is releasing stuff. I love it. So there you go. Uh, will Harry do any in-store appearances? Quite possibly. Quite possibly. All things are possible in this crazy, crazy world of ours. I don't know if I would bring him to do an in-store, though, because he would upstage me. 
it's, it's bad enough having him on video, but having him in person, my ego couldn't handle it, dude. Could not handle it. Anyway, that's pretty cool. Two sidetracks. What did Tim send me? Well, Tim sent me a stack of hand-lathed records. Yes. He went to Least Avail Studios in Brooklyn and cut these unique records. Now, I've talked about hand-lathed records before on Tent Talks Tunes. I've released quite a few on my label, TPOS, and Tim has done a thing where he went into the studio and cut these records live. Each one of these is unique. Every one of these has a unique live performance on it. No two alike. Uh, old number seven. Mm, that's one of my favorite Tim songs. That's a version of it. Good morning, Mr. Vampire. Another one of my favorite Tim songs. Now, in case you guys don't know what a hand lathed record is, the very long and short of it is they're not pressed. They're actually cut by hand on a revolving lathe by a craftsperson while the music is dictated or played or whatever live into the recorder. And that's, that's what Tim did, man. How many has he got here? Two, four, six, eight, ten of these. Am I right about that? Two. Ten. No two alike. I'm not exactly sure what the plan is on these, but if you guys are interested, let me know. I know one of these is mine. Mine, 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 mine. But I love these things, man. Single-sided, you hold it up to the light, the grooves look different from a regular pressed album. It's just like a real purity and beauty of these things. Really, really cool. So thank you, Tim, my road dog compatriot. We're going to figure out what to do with these. People need it. They want it. They got to have it. Oh, Tim. All right. What else did we get in the mail? Well, this is a, uh, another thing I love seeing, not only because it's got my address on it, but because of the manila envelope and floppy configuration, we can guess it's some kind of printed matter. Let's see what kind of printed matter is. There was apparently a return address. The return address has been concealed. But let's see if we can unconceal it. Ah, yes. This is good. This is fun. This is entertaining. This is from San Antonio, Texas. My pal Artie Flores. Artie is a true believer in physical media. That includes his awesome zine. I'm going to assume this is the latest issue of... Oh, yeah. There it is, guys. Night of the Bloody Tapes. It's a zine of all reviews of VHS movies. And apparently this one is <laughs> dedicated to combat on video. Man, his reviews are hilarious. A guy who really knows his movies and really... Yep, here we go. Navy Seals 2... What else does he review in this one? The Iron Triangle, The Last Hunter, Missing in Action, Platoon, but all from VHS. All from VHS. Full Metal Jacket, of course. Heroes Shed No Tears. Yeah, he usually does horror movies and slasher movies. This is all army movies. Who's not going to love this? Artie, thank you. As I was saying earlier, I'm not much I'm not much one for watching movies, but I'll read about movies all day, all night. All right, got a message from Dave Norton there. I'll get back to you, Dave. Dave is working on the cover of the G.G. Allen book I'm publishing on TPOS. Just saying. Okay, here's one from Frantic Records of Ashland, Oregon. And I think I know what's in this one. It's a big old box. The shape and configuration kind of reveals that it must be some kind of digital media. So let's just wantonly, willfully, rashly, wildly, uninhibitedly, yea, perhaps even insanely, open this thing up. 
There's a teaser. Can you read the teaser? Yep, there's a teaser. The box cutter. And through the whole thing, you can't see him, but you can hear him. Harry purrs on. You'll notice that I've shifted all of my activity to a little shelf off camera rather than my lap on camera. That's what I do for Harry the Cat. Accommodate, accommodate, accommodate. It's all about the accommodation. We are opening this box, and I already know what's in here, but I have not seen these discs. Packing material comes out. Here you go, guys. Brand new from my old pal, Bloody Mess. His new album, Bloody F Mess, Dark Days Unfazed. Bloody... I was introduced to Bloody Mess by uh, a guy named Brian Douglas Clemens. Brian Douglas Clemens was a dude I knew in Florida. He was a really, really great poet. Like a legit poet. This guy... He was a poet. That's what he was. He was a poet. He was an artist. Um, he loved to hop trains and just always lived on the edge. And he really walked it like he talked it. And he talked it very well. Um, so he, he was the guy who introduced me to Bloody initially. And uh, Bloody was also fans with, friends with Gigi Allen. Recorded a lot. And he's a recording artist in his own right. And this is his new album. Yes, Erica. Erica knows... Brian Douglas Clemens from the $20 poem, which I will be reissuing on TPOS sooner than later with bonus commentary track and hopefully a book to go along with it with all of Brian's poetry. Because I have a couple of his old chat books and some other things that were published elsewhere. I'm interested in doing a multimedia presentation of Brian Douglas Clemens' works. Because he was good, and he left us way too early. He lived that lifestyle right on the edge, and well, as happens, he fell over the edge, which is a very sad thing, but um, man, he was good. So yeah, new album, My Bloody F Mess, and this has got all kinds of special guests. By reading the credits on this, uh, look at that. He signed it. He knows what I like. I love him signed. I love them autographs. Oh boy. I love signing autographs, and I love collecting them, too. That's really cool. This thing has so many guests on it. I know that uh, West Beach from the Plasmatics is on here. Um, and, of course, I'm not, I'm not wearing the right glasses, so I can barely see who else is on here. Jordan Longmuir. That's not related to Derek Longmuir from the Bay City Rollers, is it? Do we have a personnel list on this bloody mess thingy? Woo-wee, but it's tiny. Whatever. Guest stars galore. From my good pal Bloody Mess, who I'm very happy to say was also walking on the edge, but is still walking with us. And yes, I ordered these. I got them. If you're interested in owning a Bloody F Mess CD and you don't want to get it from him, get them from me. I got them. But I got to tell you, the autographed one stays here. That's just the way I roll. Hey, look at that. He signed He signed at least a few of them. How cool is that? Dude, everybody gets a signed Bloody Mess CD. He signed them. Look at that. That's it. Everybody can be happy. I get mine signed. You get yours signed. If you can't get them from Bloody Mess directly, get them from me. Because I now have ten of them. But um, but um. Very excited to hear this. Very excited. Very, very excited. I name-checked Gigi Allen a second ago, as I quite often do on this show. I should mention that I have done the suicide rehearsals now on 8-track. Why? Because I could. 8-tracks are perhaps the most fun format ever made. And man, I love putting out TPOS titles on 8-track. When I teased tonight's episode earlier, I said there would be mail call, and there, would also, there was also a real sputter of activity on TPOS's front. Well, I'm weaving the two topics together. So you could say, 
two topics together on Tent Talks Tunes, or <clears throat> for short. That made Harry wake up a little bit. Sorry, guy. Sorry, guy. Apologia. I'm sorry. Atrax. How about reel-to-reel -reel tapes? I released a reel-to-reel -reel of my noise project called Fried Man. This is called The Two Faces of Fried Man. Face number one is a 16-minute soundscape recorded live during a howling ion storm. It's creepy. Face two is a tribute to the wonderful psychedelic cash-in records of the 1960s when, you know, all those fly-by-night basement-run minimum wage record labels needed a new trend to try to cash in on. Excuse me, for a brief shining moment, psychedelia was the trend. And boy, how did, did some really amazingly, wonderfully terrible music come out because of that. So on the Fried Man Reel to Reel, I've paid a tribute to that wonderful sub 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 genre. And you know, Reel to Reel is cool, but I of course did it on 8 track as well. As Flip Wilson once said, the devil made me do it. I got an 8 track mind. Can't help it. 8 track and Reel to Reel are actually, I think, perfect formats for noise music. Because there's just something really esoteric and arcane about the two that really mesh very well. And yes, I will have them on cassette and CD eventually. Eight tracks have been leading the charge this month. 2024 is just about five weeks old. And already, I've started cranking out the TPOS product. Because it's fun. Because it's what I do. We'll get back to more of that in a minute. Oh, you know what? Something I forgot to mention, too. With Harry the Cat, whether you buy the 8-track, or the cassette when it's out, or the CD when it's out, or the reel-to-reel -reel tape when it's out, you'll get a free bonus Harry the Cat paper bag puppet template. How's that for a bonus goodie? You can not only listen to Harry the Cat... You can make one of your hands pretend that they're Harry the Cat. Special free bonus with anybody who buys a Harry the Cat 8-track, cassette, or CD. And in case you're wondering, that was created by Pissy Chrissy, who has been getting rave reviews for her new album, Mind Cavity Seepage. She is not only a recording artist, a graphic artist, and yes, I'll admit that I wrote 73% of the music on this thing. The reason I did it is because I love it. I really dug her lyrics, and so we ended up collaborating on, collaborating on it. She only made 30 of these. Only 30 of these, and I've already, I've already sold out my allotment of it. She's mailing me some more, but um, it's kind of the same deal with uh, Bloody Mess. If you can't get it from him directly, get it from me. I have it. I will have it. Great album. Even if I weren't on it, it would be a great album. Still a great album. So Pissy Chrissy, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. Man, we are killing so many birds with so many stones here. Sean Mosher says he has over 1,200 eight tracks. Okay, Sean Mosher, you got 1,200? What's the best one of them? I'm putting you on the spot, dude. I want to know the name of the best 8-track that you have in your entire collection. Just one. Just one. What's the best? I know that if I were to be asked that question, I'd be extremely hard-pressed to answer it, and I don't even have 1,200 8-tracks. I probably have a couple hundred 8-tracks. But there is actually, you know, there is actually one favorite a track of mine that I have. And it's not... I don't think it's accessible. I think I have it packed away somewhere. Um, 
Maybe if I remember or if somebody reminds me, I can do a show and tell of my single favorite eight track. Adam Zister wants to know if I have all the Devo eight tracks. I do not, Adam. I only have a few. I've got two different versions of Freedom of Choice. I've got an Are We Not Men? And I'm pretty sure there's a new Traditionalists in there. So yeah, I still need Duty Now for the Future. And I need the very rare and elusive Oh No, It's Devo 8-track, which I want to say was Record Club only. Not too sure about that. But yeah. And also, as far as new traditionalists go, I have a Record Club version of the 8-track, which has kind of generic Record Club packaging. You know, it's got one of these RCA sleeves on it. And I think it's a white shell. But the uh, New Traditionalists 8-tracks that were released to the stores had really cool-looking purple shells. And I remember seeing one at Specs Music in 1981 at the Westland Mall in Hialeah, Florida. But um, I'd already, I'd already, I had already bought it on vinyl, so I didn't need it on 8-track. And if I could go back in time, I would seriously consider, I would seriously consider plunking down the $7.99 to buy the 8-track. That was another factor, too, you know. Eight tracks of cassettes typically ran about a dollar more per unit. Um, and at that time, they didn't sound as good as records and didn't have the great graphics and art as records. So my argument was always, why pay the extra dollar for a lesser product? Now, when eight tracks are being phased out... And all the 8-track titles that had been in production were being dumped on the market at discount prices. That's when I started buying 8-tracks like mad. Because you could get, I remember so well, the 99-cent 8-tracks I bought over there. So 99 cents, okay, guys? 99 cents on 8-track. I remember getting Stage by David Bowie. Studio Tan by Frank Zappa. Clear Spot by Captain Beefheart. Trans Europe Express by Kraftwerk. Um, God, so many, but those are, those are like the, the best four. Oh, the Beatles Life of the Hollywood Bowl, super deluxe English version that looked 10 times better than the American one. For a while, the, the, the cutout bins were just overflowing with eight tracks for extremely low prices. And yeah, a lot of the albums that I own to this day, I got first on 8-track, because they only cost me a buck each at the time. Dude. Salad days, guys. Salad days. All right, we got another box here. This box is kind of nondescript. This is from La Dama Dorada y su Esbosa, a.k.a. The Gelmans. And as you can see, it was indeed... Sent to Malcolm Tent, P.O. Box 3626, Newtown, Connecticut, with a specific instruction that it was for an on-air reveal. The mandate has been handed down that the contents of this box be revealed on the air. And so we're doing it. Adam Zisser says that he bets Michael Pilmer has all of the Devo A-tracks Who's going to argue that point? My good pal Michael Pilmer, who runs a website called Devo Obsesso. Enough said. Of course he's got them all. Dude. He's probably like our pal uh, Aaron Williams, who's got multiple variants of each one, you know? I mean, even I've, I've got two different versions of Freedom of Choice. It's a slippery slope, guys. Slippery slope. Let's see how slippery this slope is from the Gelmans out in the wonderful city of Tucson, Arizona. Like, no fooling, guys. One of my favorite cities. I love Tucson. Tucson is a great town. Good food, good people. Mountains. You're close to northern Mexico. All my peeps down there in Nogi Town in Nogales. Oye. Let's see what the Gelmans have sent me. I don't know, do you know what this could be. Nothing rattling. Sounds like a solid object of some sort. Mm. 
Hmm. Gary Child said that he had clear spot on 8-track. 50 cents, man. You got a better deal than I did on that thing. I guess they dumped a lot of those. That might be... I, you know, I wouldn't go say... I wouldn't go so far as to say the clear spot is my favorite Beefheart album. Top three, for sure. Top three favorite Beefheart albums, no doubt. For me, it's always been Trout Mask, of course. Dock at the Radar Station. Oh, boy. Top four. Trout Mask, Dock at the Radar Station, Clear Spot, and Strictly Personal. Those are four B-Fart records that I just adore and can put on any time and get a good listen out of. All of the others, with the exception of uh, Unconditionally Guaranteed, I can, I can listen to when the mood hits me and there's definitely great stuff on it. But those four records, prime B-Fart. Prime beef heart, just saying. Grant then thinks there's an oil filter in here. Why don't we find out? Actually, you know what? Let's not find out. He says oil filter. I'm going to say maybe uh, air filter. You think? It's not the right size. For an air filter? Gary Child says he likes Lick My Decals Off Baby. I love that record. That's a hard one to listen to. In my opinion, Decals is even harder to listen to than Trout Mask because it's more polyrhythmic. Because you've got the two drummers going on at the same time. And the real angular rhythms. And oh boy, that's a harsh record. That one and Ice Cream for Crow are, I think, the most harsh beef heart records. And I like them both, but I really got to be in a mood to uh, plunk those on. And I can listen to about one side of each of those records before giving up. But it's not like a Vinnie Vincent record. I'm not giving up because I am repulsed by it and want to vomit. I have to give up because it's just too much. There's just too much going on with those records. Love them both. Love them both. So what's it? An air filter? An oil filter? A pair of shoes? What did the Gelman send me? Let's find out. In this SOB man, cold unboxing. We got some packing material. What is this? All right, I gotta put this over to the side. Okay, first of all, I see a t shirt. What kind of a t shirt is this? Standard Deviance. Standard Deviance, is this one of Murray Gellin's new bands? What is this? The people want to know. I don't know, but I like it and I'm gonna wear it. Murray Gelman, if you're out there and you're watching, please explain the meaning behind this t-shirt because not only do I want to know, but we've got an entire universe full of people out there in Tent Talks Tunes land who want to know. I think it's one of your bands. And I'm going to leave that statement to stand unless you either refute it or confirm it. All right, here we go. Standard Deviance. T-shirt. Oh, here's the thing. Oh, my God. This is a name that I did not think I was going to see in about forever. This is a genuine CDR of a band called Mongoloids in Crayon Suits. <sighs> How does one even try to describe a band with a name like that? 1990 to 1992. I have a cassette by this band. And... Um, Let's just say that it's very normal. It's extremely normal. Very rational, very sane, very um, nice. Mongoloids and crayon suits, and now it's on CD. Oh boy. I hope my CD player can take it. And here's something. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. See, Mer the Gelmans know where my literary tastes lie. And I'm going, this is, ooh, this is a, a few things in one. This is where I have to uh, send something back in absolute gratitude. The Gelmans know that what I love, Silver Age and Bronze Age Marvel Comics. Oh my God. I bought, I bought my first ever, my first ever Marvel comic in 1974. It was Fantastic Four number 151. And to me, that's the very definition of what Marvel comics are all about. 
And Marvel, of course, is better than DC any day, any way. So check it out, man. Submariner. Deathlock. The Defenders. Man, I love all these titles. Gelmans, thank you so much. I appreciate this immensely. And um, since they say, truthfully, that no good deed goes unpunished, I'm going to send something to you guys post-haste. Because I feel like it. No oil filter. Sorry, Grant. Just fine American literature. Speaking of fine American literature, you know what this is? Speaking of comic books and fine American literature, this is a comic and coloring book by Gary Forney. If any of you people out there are fans of outsider music or the song poem genre, or if you all just like intensely original, unique music, Gary Forney is your man. As of yesterday, I've officially got two full-length Gary Forney releases on TPOS, one called Chicken Insurrection, one called An Ordinary Life. I think I said it all. Original singer-songwriter, translated by song-poem artists, equals genius. Two full-length albums on cassette. I got them on CD as well. And as per our earlier topic of discussion, 8-track, 8-track, 8-track. We had to do Gary Forney on 8-track. It was meant to be Gary Forney from LaPorte, Iowa. A proud addition to the TPOS lexicon of stars. So if you order anything by Gary Forney on record, sorry, got to strike that, on tape, CD, or 8-track, you get a free signed numbered Gary Forney comic book. I only have 25 of these, minus the few I'm keeping for myself. But yes, look at these free things you get, man. A free Harry the Cat paper bag puppet if you order a Harry the Cat 8-track cassette or CD. Free Gary Forney comic book if you order one of his cassettes, CDs, or 8-tracks. TPOS is good to the people. It's also how I stay in, stay out of trouble. Y'all get me too busy making these things to send out to you, the educated consumers. So I can't go around my neighborhood doing weird things like some of the weird people in my neighborhood do, like taking little tiny itty bitty plastic baby dolls and stapling them to the phone poles. I don't know why that is, but my neighborhood has lots of little tiny itty bitty plastic baby dolls stapled to the telephone poles. I think it's hilarious. I would love to know what the story is behind that and who's doing it. Then again, I kind of hope I never find out because what's more fun than a mystery? Ah, sweet mystery of life at last I've found you. And you're a little tiny plastic baby stapled to a pole. Yes, it's so cool, it's so cool. Whew. That's it. That's all the mail I got. That's all the mail I got. Standard Deviants t-shirt. Bloody F mess CDs. Night of the Bloody Tapes. Print zine. Tim Holehouse. Ten individually different, unique hand lathe records. That's a pretty good stretch of mail, man. New TPOS product, 8-tracks, Gary Forney, Fried Man, Harry the Cat. Look at that. People going on and on and about 24 tracks. Well, here we go, 24 tracks on three cartridges, all available from TPOS. Fried Man on Reel to Reel. Gigi Allen on 8-track. Gary Forney on cassette and CD from Iowa, baby. Pissy Chrissy on CD. And the mysterious and enigmatic Whirly Gig on cassette. We don't know what, if anything, is going to happen to this, but I'll be listening to it. 
I'll be listening to it. Don't you worry about that. It will be heard. Thank you, one and all. This has been fun. I've had a good time opening my mail and sharing it with all you guys. Thanks for joining me. bad news is that I will not be doing Tent Talks tunes for at least the next two weeks because of the aforementioned Pro Phonautica tour. I'm going to be gone from next Tuesday until March 3rd. Now let's take a look at the, a real calendar here. Excuse me while I uh, reach over here once again and let you guys take a look at my chrome dome up close and personal. So I'm going to be coming back March 3rd. That's a Sunday. Okay, so I should be back on the air March 6th, which means I will be gone probably only two weeks. So, cool beans. And uh, if it goes the way it usually goes, I should have plenty of tales and stories and pictures and whatnot to be posting as the tour progresses because tour life is the best life. I love going out there and seeing the world excuse me, from the ground up, going local, and uh, sharing it with all of you guys. So definitely keep your eyeball peeled and open for breaking events as they relate to tour for the next couple of weeks while I'm out there with Profanautica. And so, um, yeah, that's about it. I'll see you guys when I see ya, which will be uh, sooner or later. So until we meet again, this is Malcolm Tent saying so long from the Nutmeg State.